All right, with that being said, we're going to open up our Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll be specifically in verses 17 all the way to chapter 5, verse 2. You will see the words on the screen this morning. But let me go ahead and give you the title to the message this morning before we pray. Putting anger on the hanger. How's that for a rhyme? Putting anger on the hanger. Would you pray with me this morning? Our Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much that you've given us a heart and made a way for us to be with you this morning. We are so grateful, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives. And we continue to pray, Lord, that you would have your way, that we would put off the old man, the old nature, the old ways of thinking and living. Lord, that you would continue to conform us into the image of your son, that you would have your way in us, Lord, and that we would be participators in that important work, Lord, that we should live lives that look so much different than the world, Lord, that we should be the difference uh, in that you indwell us now and show us how to live holy and godly lives, Lord. But Father, help us this morning to recognize where the anger comes from that can be in our lives, how it can overtake us, destroy us, and hinder us from being the light, the example to the world that you want us to be. And that example, an example of love and forgiveness that our world so desperately needs. Would you forgive us for our sins and cleanse us, Lord? We come here as sinful people, committing sin and, and doing things and acting in ways we shouldn't have, Lord. And we ask you to cleanse us from that and continue, Lord, to sanctify our lives and draw us into that right living, Lord, that can glorify you. Please, Lord, do that in our lives today as we confess to you. We love you, Lord. And again, we give you our, we give you our sick that need healing this morning, and there are many, Lord, and we just lift up all the families of our church, Lord, and without, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In a minute, I'm gonna have you watch a video, uh, but I wanna start with this question. How do you live the Christian life in a world filled with so much confusion and brokenness and not respond in anger? Ultimately, anger is not the problem. It's what we do with it is the problem. But where does it come from? When we exhibit anger as believers, that should be an oxymoron in the Christian life. For anger is something that controls the lives and outbursts of anger and bitterness and wrath touch our world in such evil ways and we see its outfall. We see the death and the carnage and the, and the loneliness that comes from anger, the hostility in our world that comes from anger. But I want to take a moment, if you will, and have you watch this video with me, would you? Have you ever thought about that? Anger says, God, I'm not pleased with you or how you're handling my life situation. Because ultimately, what have you heard from this pulpit over and over and over again? That God is sovereign, he's in control of every aspect of your life, every human being that comes into your life, every reaction of every human being, everything that happens in your life has to pass through the hands of God first before it happens or is made out to be anything else. It has to pass through his hands. So sometimes God does allow irritating people in our lives. Sometimes God does allow us to get cut off in, in traffic, right? Doesn't that get you your blood boiling, as they say? You're going down the road, and all of a sudden, unexpectedly, somebody slams on their brakes for some phantom reason. We're looking, going, what is going on? And, and instantly, there's this, this reaction of anger that can jump up out of us. But I want to propose to you something that that anger comes from a reservoir. You can't be angry unless it's in you, there, waiting to be spilled, right? If your heart, if your bowl is filled with anger, it doesn't take much for that anger to spill over into the lives of other people. And so God is going to give us a wonderful antidote, a wonderful mechanism, a plan of how to make sure that we put off, get rid of, take that anger, and as I put it this morning, Put it on the hanger. Get it out of your life. Shouldn't be there to spill over. With his anger, God replaces it with what? Peace and love and forgiveness. You know, when that person runs, cuts you off, right? Give him two fingers, not one. 
You know, don't, don't let yourself react. Put that away in your life. If you know you're prone to react that way in traffic, be prepared to be cut off. Now, when you cut somebody else off, right, you're hoping they'll say, it's okay, no problem, right? That's what you want from them. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you is my answer to that. So be prepared to be cut off and be prepared to respond with, it's okay. I'm glad we didn't get into an accident. I'm glad that you're safe and I'm safe. I'm glad that neither one of us has to go in an ambulance. I'm thankful that neither one of us has to call our insurance company or call the police or, or go to a hospital or, God forbid, leave this earth in death. You see, if that anger is in our, in our hearts and filled in our hearts, it's going to come out. And it gets built up. It can get built up over time. I love how Mr. Welch was talking about how there's that, cool, that cooled anger, which is just building up inside. It's an anger that... Is just complaining all day long. Oh, thing is, here we go again. Why can't I have this and why can't I have that? You know, you have to recognize what you're saying and who's hearing that. You're saying, God, I don't like the manager that you are in my life. You made me and put me on this earth so you can torture me and give me not what I need, but to keep the things I need just out of reach. You torture me, God. You don't love me, God. That's what we're saying. That's what we're saying. And so it's so important for us to confront this in our lives. Some people don't even re realize they have an anger problem. They've been doing it so long. They're callous to it, we'll learn in the Bible. So, what a, so we need to do something. We hear that a lot in the news, don't we? Just do something. Just do something. And what's frustrating is always the answer is some superficial thing that's going to look good in front of everybody, but ultimately isn't going to solve any long-term problems. But God has an idea about what we need to do. We need to make a revolutionary change in our lives. We need to reject the old angry man, the old angry nature, the old ways of living that we lived before we came into relationship with Jesus Christ. And we have to exhibit and start to live in the new man, the new life God's given us. When God comes into our lives and the Holy Spirit takes control of our lives, he takes the anger out as we put it off. We have this beautiful image we're going to see this morning of, of like taking clothing off. We take it off and we put it away. And what's good about putting it away? It, it doesn't define us anymore. We're not wearing it as a uniform, nor is it there for us to exhibit. It's not in our hearts and what's in our hearts that's replaced it now is love and forgiveness that quickly says, it's okay. It's all right. And so, the new man, in the new way, it's patiently trusting in God in all matters of life. Whatever and whomever brings you to that place of anger, God knows what's going on. And you have to leave it up to him. But make no mistake about it. I'm not sure if it's that hot anger that's more deadly or that cool anger that's more deadly. Because it's every day just complaining. <coughs> complaining. And it makes you more and more angry and more and more bitter and more and more resentful. Doesn't that why that God says in the love chapter, Do not, love does not keep track of wrongs. As we, as we harbor resentment against others, that bowl of anger gets a little more added to it every day. Until one day, what happens? It gets kicked over. It's the last straw, right? And that, and that bitterness and the resentment comes out in anger. And we hurt people that we love. I, I think we saw that exhibited so powerfully and deliberately with what happened with Mr. Will Smith some months ago at that award show. That anger was in him. It was not that one word or one act of another person who said something. That was in him, likely built up over years, over time. And it came to the point where it was ready to overflow, and it did in the most violent way. And I guarantee if you were, if Mr. Smith was here today and I asked him, would you like to do that over again? He would have begged to take it all back. That there could have been a better way to handle that. 
I've even thought about how, how he could have done something so productive, but used love instead. He could have, in the middle of that ceremony, made a different kind of spectacle. He could have got up from his chair quietly, and the same response probably would have happened from, uh, was it Chris Rock? He would have went, ooh, Will Smith's coming. And he would have walked up, and he could have stood right next to him, and he could have put his hand on his shoulder. He could have said, Chris, my friend, my brother, man, I've known you for so many years. Do you see my wife's face? what you just said, and I know you probably didn't mean it, but you hurt her. And when you hurt her, you hurt me. See, she has a disease that makes her hair fall out now. She doesn't want to look like that. Now, I know you didn't mean to hurt her, but words matter. And what you said hurt her. Would you do me a favor? There's a lot of things you can make fun of and make us laugh. Just think about before you do your next joke that you don't hurt anyone. And you say, I love you, brother could have sat down. What would he have accomplished then? Would he have accomplished more? Would he would he be would he wake up the next day and feel regretful? No. I bet you he could have changed the world with love instead of the anger. And that's what happens. Marriages are ruined by anger. Friendships are ruined by anger. Partnerships are ruined by anger. Children are ruined by anger. That's where it starts. That's why the Bible says, provoke not your children to anger. Parents do it all the time. They don't even realize it. They provoke their children to anger. Sometimes it's obvious by ridicule, by words that are discouraging, missing love, missing reaffirmment. It can also happen by not doing things that parents should do, like bringing them to the Lord, helping them to know and love Jesus. Certainly a child who was raised in this world with no moral compass designed by God for them to, to know is going to have an effect in their life. Didn't it happen in Uvalde, Texas? Isn't that what happened? I assure you, that young man who killed all those children was not habitated by the Spirit of God. Instead, his life was void of God. There was a failure of a father. There was the failure of a mother. There was a grandmother doing the best she could, but was not designed to be the mother or father, to instill those principles in this young man. Instead, his life was left empty. Vacancy, light was on for Satan to come and for his hatred, his evil, to dwell. And he had a vessel to use. But that's what can happen. He can come, and and anger, we're going to find out, is a tool that Satan can use. But listen to what it says in Ephesians 4, 17. This I say, therefore. Now remember, anytime you see therefore, we're supposed to see what it's there for. And at this point in Ephesians 4, Paul has already discussed all the, all the spiritual gifts that God has given to the church and to us to help us to, to walk in the new life that God has for us, to walk godly lives. So he says, this I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk or live as the rest of the Gentile walk in the fertility of their mind. He tells them, don't, don't live your life like un- the unbelieving world does. That's what he means by Gentiles. Who, in their walk, and they, they live in a way that they have fertility in their mind. Their lives serve no useful purpose other than to bring them self-gratification. That's it. The purpose of a life is me. Me, me, and one more, me. In every area of life. And whatever gets in the way needs to be bulldozed, needs to be taken out of the way. Do you ever see And notice how anger can do that? Sometimes anger can draw people away from another person. They don't even understand it. They feel gratification by letting the anger off, but they don't realize what they're doing to the other person. It's driving them away, and then they stand there and they say, I don't know what their problem is. I like me. 
Yeah, of course you do, because you're living selfishly. You're living for you and not for others, the way the Bible tells us to, and the way we're going to be admonished to in a moment. But so don't live like the world. Don't live like them who, who live in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated or shut out from the life of God. Why? Because of the ignorance that's in them, the lack of knowledge. Because of the blindness of their heart, who are being past feeling. Remember that. Having given themselves over to lewdness and to walk in all uncleanness with greediness. See, the, the, these worldly people who live in the world outside and, and not equipped with the work of God in them and the Holy Spirit, they're past feeling. They're callous. Not a sensitive bone in their, in their body. My wife and I were out to dinner and, and we saw this other couple uh, near, our, near our, uh, where we were having our dinner. And uh, we just started to kibitz with them a little bit, talk with them, and, and this man started to go on and on and on about himself. Oh, boy. He, he lectured us for a half hour about who he was and what he's done, and, and, I, and his wife was trying to get some words in, and he kept on saying, excuse me, I'm talking. And, and it was just, I seen my wife, my, I thought my wife's head was going to pop off. But, uh, and so finally after he, told me all about who he was and how great he was, he finally said, do you know who I am? I said, yeah, I know who you are. And he was a person who owned a dealership locally. He's been on TV many, many times. We've all seen him. I won't tell you who he is, but uh, he was obnoxious. He was a man filled with himself. I assure you, if I did surgery on that man's heart, I would find a heart that was rock solid. No place for God to get in. Callous. And that's what can happen. And that's what happens with a world that's void of God. We can get that way too if we're not careful. We have to let the rule and the Holy Spirit rule over our lives. But ultimately, this is a condition of the world's heart. And they've given themselves over to lewdness and to work all uncleanness and greediness. It just speaks of a self centered life. We, we, this should not be foreign to us because this is who we were. Remember the days on Sunday morning? You woke up when you felt like it and uh, maybe you looked at the newspaper. You, uh, you know, got ready for the beach, got ready for golfing, lounged around in your pajamas all day, thought about, hmm, what am I going to eat today? What sports am I going to watch? That day was me day until you fell in love with Jesus until he indwelled your life. And you said, no, today is a day that I need to be filled up. Today is a day that I need my heart protected and kept soft to the things of God. And you find yourself in the house of God on Sundays now. But, but we can remember the days when we were, we were ignorant like this, that we were blind and we were calloused. And so Paul goes on to say, but you, he's speaking to Christians, believers, Christ followers, but you, have not so learned Christ. You should be different, he's going to say. If indeed you have heard him, Jesus, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you, and he's going to give us a step-by-step -step process of how we can put away this old man and the anger that dwells in him. So he says, you have not so learned Christ if you indeed heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off, step one, concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be what? Renewed, made new in the spirit of your mind. So he gives us step one, and he uses this analogy of clothing, <coughs> where he says, go to the closet and take off the old man. Take him off. Take off his nature. Take off his selfishness. Take off his lewdness. Take off his anger. Take off his habitual sinning and selfishness. Take it off. Why does he want you to do that? Because he doesn't want you to have it as a mode anymore. Remember the bowl full with anger? It's not there anymore to spill over. So he gives this analogy like clothing. Put off. Take off. Put the anger on the hanger, if you will. Let me give you this thought. Think about a prisoner, somebody who's been in, in the penitentiary for years, maybe 20, 30 years. They wore, they wore a prison uniform, overalls, maybe bright orange with the numbers. 
inmate 7727, right? He gets set free. He gets time for him. He served his time. It's time for him to go free. What if he left the prison and walked around in that prison garb in life? He doesn't have to be in the prison anymore, but he puts that on every day. People are going to look at him. They're going to say, did you escape? Are you an inmate? He's identifying himself. This is who I am. And yet he doesn't have to. He's been set free. And yet he chooses to wear that uniform every day still. Wouldn't that be crazy? You'd say to him, you don't need to do that anymore. You're free now. Do you realize when we harbor anger and this bitterness and this, in these evil traits, character, it's like we wake up every day and we put the prison uniform back on. And yet we don't have to, and yet we do sometimes. But God tells us not to. Take, take it off. You're not in prison anymore. You're not, a, you're not um, ruled by that old nature and old man anymore. He has no power over you. You've been given a new outfit to wear. You're clothed in Jesus Christ, in his purity and his holiness. So take off those clothes, and that's exactly step one of what, of what Paul, through the Holy Spirit, through God, tells us to do. Put off the old man, the old way. The way you used to react when you got angry, the way you used to, to indulge your lusts, drinking alcohol, pornography, that should be part of the old man, the old way of thinking, the old way of living. But not anymore. So step one, do that. Take it off. But then look what he goes on to say. And be renewed in the spirit of the mind in that you put on the new man. This step two, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So he gives us step one and step two. Okay? He's talking about our Christian conduct, our Christian life, how we live daily, how we walk. Right? What does the Bible say? If you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill what? The lust of the flesh. You won't be the old man, is what Paul's talking about. But if I was to stand up here t today and said, okay, I'm going to go for a walk. You'd say, Pastor, you didn't go for a walk. You took a step. What is it, what is it required for me to say I took a walk? I have to take one step, and then I have to duplicate it. I have to take another step. Now, if I want to make it a walk, what do I need to do? I need to keep doing it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Now I've taken a walk. This is what God is saying. That to go from the old man to the new man, we have to take steps. Step one, take off the old man. Get those things out of your life. They are no longer there. They're no longer part of and in the heart of you, to harden your heart. They're gone. They've been put off. They've been hung up. And then put on. This two-step action, which is repeated daily, becomes the walk of a Christian. Listen to what Ray Stedman said. I'm a big, a big fan of his exposition. But listen to what he said. How do you walk? Well, you put one leg in ahead of the other. This is, step, this is one step, but that is not a walk. Then what? Then you put the other leg ahead of that one. So he goes on to say, as the whole life is to be lived by the continual exercise of this principle, this is a walk. And this is why the word comes to us. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now this works right out into life. Christian faith is not designed merely to get us involved in religious activity. There is nothing God dislikes more than religion. He is interested in life. True life has religious aspects and that it is, it is all right. But religion alone is an empty and distasteful thing to God. He says so repeatedly, both in the Old and the New Testaments. But he is interested in seeing true principles being applied to the situations where you live. And when they are, they create an obvious change of behavior in your life. That's what it's all about. We're born again into a new life, into a new way of living. And it should look nothing like the world. There is a part of, of even Christendom today that within the church, they think the church needs to, to change itself 
and look like the world so that people will come in and want to be a part of us. That is not what the Bible tells us to do. The Bible tells us to be set apart. To be different than the world. No, we need to stay true to what the truth is. And the truth is, God's word still needs to be preached. Preach. It needs to be heard. It needs to be learned. And it needs to be lived out. And let the world come in and let them be changed. Not us change to make them more comfortable. But there's a huge part of the church that's doing that now. And those churches are well attended because they've compromised. Make the chairs more comfy. Let's get the, the, let's find out what the perfect ambient temperature is for a room. Let's find out what they like for snacks. Let's like, let's, let's, let's find out what kind of music they like. Let's, let's dumb the sermon down so much so that even an infant can understand it. And let's not talk about sin. We don't want to offend them. We don't, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to tell them the truth in a sense. I mean, you don't tell people about what God's sinner for living is and what the right Christian way of living is. You're lying to them. You're stumbling people when you don't do that as a man of God. So sometimes I stand up here and I tell the truth and people get offended and they leave and they don't want to come back. They want to go somewhere where they can be told, you're fine. God loves you, even though you just sin it up. <laughs> it's all good. Don't worry. You'll be fine. No change. The bowl of anger is filled up because no one's ever told them, you're supposed to put that away. That ungodly living is supposed to go away. And so, we're given a caution in specifically talking about anger. There should be a time limit on anger. We're going to hear in the, in the preceding verses, let, let, let. That talks about us and our free will. We've got to let some of these things happen in our lives. The Spirit wants to lead us out of that anger. The, God, that the, the Spirit of God living inside of us wants to lead us away from that selfishness and that self-centeredness. But we've got we to be participators in that. We gotta go to the closet and we gotta take off those stinking clothes. We gotta take off that prison uniform. It does not define us anymore. That's who we were. We've been set free. And we've been given a garment that's pure and holy and white. We just need to put it on and start living like we deserve to wear that. It's time. So Paul goes on to say, therefore, put away lying. Let, notice that, each one of you speak truth through his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And here comes that anger issue again in verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. He's saying you can be angry. It's an emotion God gave us. Jesus got angry. Remember? Walked in the temple. They were robbing the people, exploiting them. He called it a den of thieves. You've made my house of prayer a den of thieves. And he took the many changes tables, these corrupt spiritual leaders, and he flipped them over. Angry. Jesus was angry at greed. Jesus was angry at his house being used for such ungodly purposes. He was angry at those things. Those same people, when he's on the cross, he says, forgive them, for they know not what you do. So what's Jesus angry at? Is he angry at the people, or is he angry at their actions? We can be angry. Why don't you start with being angry that you're still so selfish? Be angry at you. Be angry that you're still angry. Be angry that you haven't been able to make a full commitment to God. Be angry that, that God still isn't number one in your life. Be angry at that. But don't be angry at your wife. Don't be angry at your husband. Don't be angry at your children. Remember what Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Be forgiving. Be loving. We're going to get the antidote. It's coming. Be angry and do not sin. And then he says this. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. He's putting a time limit on it. 
don't harbor, don't store up anger. Resentment, bitterness. In some people's lives, that anger and that bitterness is, is just seething. It's in there. It's going to come out and then, boom! It happens. That's why God says, don't let that sin remain in you. Before the sun goes down, deal with it. Because if you don't, he says in verse 27, you're going to give place to the devil. You've given the devil a weapon. All he's got to do, that bowl is filled with anger, all he's got to do is just give you a little bump, and it spills out. And it hurts children, and it hurts husbands, and it hurts wives and marriages, and it hurts, it hurts you in your workplace. You lose your job. I don't know why they fired me. I have a, I'm a hard worker, as they say it in anger. You don't see it. Goes on to say, let him who steals, steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands. What is good that he may have something to give to him who has need. And then he says this in verse 29, because anger comes out a lot with words. He says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. We can provoke others to anger with our words. We can just be sarcastic. We can be rude, judgmental. James 1.19 says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and guess what? Slow to anger. So when we get angry, you ever hear this terminology? Count to three. Anyone ever hear that? Get angry, count to three. One, two, three. Okay. Now, what happens when you're very angry? You count to 100. That's all. You might need to do that. But here's the thought. Don't react. Give room for the Holy Spirit to make that adjustment. The, the reservoir of anger is gone. You put it off. It, it might take a little while in the beginning for you to start to, to realize, uh, okay, being angry, that's going to cost me something. It may feel a little good right now, but it's going to cost me something, and it's going to cost me more than I want to pay. So i got to i got to wait. Let me just give time for the Holy Spirit to speak to me, lead me away from this disaster, and bring me to a place where I can think and hear from God, and now I can say and react in the way that will bring edification. Instead of tearing down that person, I can build them up. Do you see how that works? But if we don't leave room, it's boom! And then you can't take it back. I'm sure Will Smith would do anything in the world that his life had rewind in it, that he could play that scene over again. But look at, listen to what happens in verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you've been sealed for the day of rejection, uh, redemption. When we, when we act in these fleshly, in the old nature, in the old self, we grieve the Holy Spirit, and that's a safety device. That's a good thing. When you, when you say something hateful, when you hurt someone, for the believer... They should, they should walk away not too far and realize, oh, I shouldn't have did that. I shouldn't have said that. Oh. Mm, I hate that, that. I let this hatred dominate my life. Lord, take it away. And then we've got to turn. And we've got to do the humble thing. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. We've got to be able to go back and say, I'm sorry. That was out of line. I was wrong. And what I said is not true. Please forgive me. I've had to do that. It's humiliating, but I know that God looks down on it and is very pleased. So try it. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away. Take it off from you with all malice. And here's the solution. Here's how the new man acts. And be kind to one another. This is the new way, the new man. This is his new way of living. Be tender-hearted forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. See, God's going to tell us in one minute what the main ingredient is that will bring us to this place to forgive others and to be tenderhearted. It's going to take a resource that can only come from God. Love. Remember what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13? 
love is patient and is what? Kind. Kind. A kind person doesn't tell people off and tell them where to go and how to get there. That's not what a kind person does. That's not what a tender-hearted person does. A callous person does that. And they say, mmm, that felt good. They deserved it. And they walk away saying, I showed them. And then they, there's always wreckage behind that hurts, ends up hurting you, not the other person, as much as it hurts you. You, you hurt the very thing you love. We'll end with this, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore be imitators of God, dear children. He started out with saying you should no longer walk like the world. Don't act like the world. Don't live like the world. Don't, don't be lewd. Don't be, be um, deceitful. Don't be angry. And don't speak hateful words. But instead be imitators of God, dear children, and listen, walk in love. Remember the steps? Put off the anger and the wrath. Put on the love of God. Step by step, every day, practice it. It's meant to be repeated over and over and over again. And you know what happens? There comes a time where you used to always respond in anger, where you start to always respond in love. But you've got to practice it. And walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, an offering as in a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. The church does not need to compromise and make itself more like the world to make it more comfortable. We need to show them there is a better way. There is God's way. We do not need to conform to the world's solutions and the world's ways. We need to show them our transformed life, a life filled with gentleness and love and peace and joy and, of course, forgiveness. But it starts with hanging up the anger. Listen, angry people don't forgive. Have you ever seen someone say, I can't stand you, you've always been a jerk, you're a jerk now, and I forgive you. No, that's not how it goes, does it? It leads to a death of a relationship. Let me end with this. Put anger on the hanger and put on love from above. How, how's that for a rhyme? Would you pray with me this morning? Our Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you so much for the reservoir of life that we find in your word through your Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that he would continue his work in us, that he would help us and show us that we don't have to wear that uniform of the old man. We've been set free. Help us to exchange it, to put that anger on the hanger in the, in the closet and put it away once and for all. It's to put on the new man in Christ Jesus. You've given us white garments to wear of holiness and love and forgiveness. Father, in this transformation, I know marriages will be restored, friendships restored. There will be power in the homes where there is recklessness and devastation. But we need you to help us to do it, Lord. You've given us the truth today. Help us to learn it and help us to live it so that we can be the example you want us to be. Thank you so much, Lord, for what you're doing in and through all of our lives. Bless us now as we go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you and have a wonderful Sunday.